Well, good morning again, everyone. We began a new series last week on the book of Daniel, and this week we find ourselves in the second chapter. We had the chance to just reflect on a part of that passage, but I'd like to put that small passage in the bigger picture of Daniel chapter two. It's a long chapter, but this is how the story goes. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, who had taken Daniel and his fellow Israelites captive, had this ominous dream, excuse me, that caused him great anxiety. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to remember the details of the dream, and he didn't know what it meant, and so he asked the wise men of Babylon to uh, both remember it and interpret it for him. When no one said that they could do it, he then threatened to kill all the wise men in Babylon if they wouldn't provide him with the answer. So you can imagine the anxiety that this created. Daniel's very life was at risk, and so he asked God for help, that God would reveal this dream to him, and God, in fact, did. In the passage that we reflected on, we we heard his song of praise of God's provision in this difficult situation. So it was a really weird dream, and I want to talk a little bit about this dream. And upon first read of Daniel 2, we might struggle to find out how this connects, but, but here's the dream. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of this image, Uh, this large statue that is made up of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay. And out of nowhere, this small rock that is not carved out of human hands, an important detail which we'll talk about, comes and hits the bottom of the statue, the feet of the statue, and it all comes crumbling down. Daniel proceeds to talk about how the kingdom of God is something that is going to bring down the various powers of this world. These powers are built on a weak foundation. One of the things uh, Julie and I are doing right now is looking at a lot of houses. We've been uh, searching for homes, and a couple weeks ago, we went and saw this cute old home in the lettered streets that was built in 1905. We kind of have a thing for old houses, and we thought this might be a good one for us. And so we walked through the house that had the old original floors, it had been updated a little bit, and we were pretty excited about it until we stepped into the master bedroom. And as we walked in, we found ourselves suddenly off balance and realized that in the middle of the floor, the the flooring was bowed and it was not level. Something that creates deep anxiety for people that are about to potentially invest a lot of money in a new home. This is an image that I think is representative of a point that's significant in real estate and also in our own lives. That sometimes below the surface of things, below the things that look like a good investment or that they are alluring or they look uh, like a, a great fit on the outside, there can be some weaknesses in the foundation or some weaknesses under the surface, behind the walls. And just as we would not want to make that investment in a home that's not level, that perhaps has a faulty foundation, today what I want to explore in this text is some of the the weak foundations of some of the worldly powers, the worldly idols that we might be tempted to invest in, to build our life upon. I think that's the core image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and and the, the key point that this text is trying to make. But some of the powers of this world, while they look powerful, while they look successful, have the potential to come crumbling down. Now, a lot of people, when they first read Daniel 2, get really interested in the bigger picture of what's being described. Uh, as Daniel interprets the dream he, ta- dream, he talks about these successive kingdoms that each metal represents, and how the kingdom of God at some point is going to break into history and bring down these kingdoms. And and to be sure, that is a significant part of interpreting Daniel 2. There's this cosmic view, this big view of history and of how God's kingdom is going to endure all these earthly kingdoms. But I, I wanna suggest to you today that there is also a universal point that is being communicated in this text. So this isn't just an interesting history lesson. It's not just an interesting exploration of prophecy. 
But the text itself tells us that the point being made in this dream is a point that is relevant to us today in our cultural moment and in our personal lives. It's not just about trying to pinpoint this time in history when things are going to happen. It's something that is very much at work in our midst today. And there's a couple things in the text that invite us to have a broader application of this dream that some emperor thousands of years ago had. <clears throat> First of all, we just notice in the text that this stone that brings down the statue brings down all parts of the statue. It's a word of warning to all kingdoms, all earthly powers, not just one moment in human history. Another thing that's just notable in the book of Daniel is that these images of gold and silver and bronze and iron are often used to depict idolatry, these idols that the Israelites and others are tempted to turn to wherever they find themselves. In Daniel 5, verse 23, Daniel confronts Nebuchadnezzar's son, who has now taken power, and he says this. He says, instead, you have set yourself against the Lord of heaven. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Here we see a very similar use of imagery to what Nebuchadnezzar's dream is all about, and it's all about idolatry. That things like wealth, represented by gold and silver, things like power, represented by iron, all these worldly idols, things like status, if we are not careful, can capture our heart. And the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had reminds us that these things are a weak foundation that they will not hold true, that they will come crumbling down if that is the foundation we build our life on. What I'd like to do today as we seek to apply this text to our experience is to view this from both the lens of Daniel and the lens of Nebuchadnezzar, to connect with both perspectives in this story, because I think this speaks to us on a couple of levels. From the perspective of Daniel, I think what this text tells us is that there is hope for those of us who are overwhelmed by the powers of evil in this world. For those who are on the receiving end of oppression or the receiving end of evil and the brokenness of this world, Daniel is in a tight spot. His very life is at risk because of the tyranny the, the evil of Nebuchadnezzar. We see this unreasonable request, tell me what my dream was and interpret it or else you will be murdered. I, need, I think we need to just hold up regularly in this text, these familiar stories, just how terrifying that was for Daniel. That he is the victim of the powers of evil in this world. And I think one of the ways that this text speaks to us today is it speaks a word of hope to those of us who are overwhelmed, discouraged by the ways that the powers of evil continue to work in our world. For some of us, maybe on a personal level, in one way or another, we are on the receiving end of oppression, implicated by the brokenness and the evil and the the decisions that other people are making that are making life hard for us. And maybe like Daniel, some of us, although probably not as an extreme way, feel ourselves caught in the crossfire of a world gone wrong. Some of us maybe are feeling that personally. Others of us are maybe just feeling a vicarious suffering as we look upon a world full of oppression. For we too have news feeds filled with story of, of brokenness, of evil, of greed, of violence, and it can overwhelm us. And in the face of these things that just seem insurmountable, these large looming towers of evil and power in this world, it can feel as if we don't have a lot of hope. And it can even cause us to wonder if the, the values of the kingdom of God have much to do, have any chance of success against the powers of violence and evil in this world? What do word and sacrament have to respond 
to weapons of mass destruction. Right? What does forgiveness do in the face of oppression? I think in our fears of a, a world gone wrong, we can perhaps sometimes wonder, where is God in those places? And we might even be tempted to pick up the weapons of this world to fight the, the conflicts that we are up against. Our text, though, reminds us that the kingdom of God is, in fact, more powerful than the powers of this world, that this small stone seems so insignificant in the face of this giant statue has the capacity to bring down those powers. That the small mustard seed acts of love and joy and patience and kindness will grow up into this large tree it's a similar image in this text. This small stone brings down these powers and turns into this large mountain that fills the earth, that is this firm foundation. Can you trace that in your own experience to see that these small acts of love have the capacity to disarm the powers of this world? I think we have a fitting example before us even this week. As we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. today, we have an example of someone who intentionally chose the gospel values of nonviolence in the face of oppression. I want to read a, a well-known quote from Martin Luther King, where he says that darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate simply begets hate, violence begets violence, toughness begets a greater toughness. We must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. So from Daniel's perspective, this text gives us hope. It says that as we commit ourselves to the kingdom of God, to the ways of God, that, that this kingdom will ultimately bring down the powers that we fear, that we find overwhelming. At the end of our text, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. And it foreshadows the promise in Philippians 2, where it's, Nebuchadnezzar says that, to Daniel, your God is the true God of gods and the Lord of all kings. Paul says in Philippians 2 that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Philippians 2, we have this great hope that this crucified Christ who took on the nature of a servant who humbled himself will be lifted up and all these other powers will be humbled. We see that playing out in this story today. Does that perhaps speak a word of hope to some of us who are just overwhelmed by the powers of this world? But I wanna also now come at this from another angle. I think we can read ourselves into the story as Daniel, but I'd like to us to also read ourselves into the story as Nebuchadnezzar. You know, I think we have a tendency to align ourselves with the good guys in a story, right? The hero of the story. But I think there's a word to us today that perhaps we have a tendency in our own lives to build our lives on a foundation of worldly power and the various idols of this world. I don't want us to just externalize this problem and see the problem out there. But like Nebuchadnezzar, I, I think that we sometimes have a tendency to build our life on faulty foundations. We too can seek security and hope and meaning and identity and things like wealth and things like power and things like upward mobility. In the next uh, chapter that Elliot's actually going to speak on next week, we see that Nebuchadnezzar builds this big gold shiny statue to honor himself. And I think if we're honest, we in our own ways kind of want to be shiny. <laughs> we want to be noticed by the things we purchase, the things we buy, the things we do. We all, like Nebuchadnezzar, I think, have this internal insecurity, this need to be loved, this need to have purpose, this desire for control. Right? 
so I think this story speaks to this common human experience that we often build our lives on these worldly idols. Notice, though, that in the story, Nebuchadnezzar's response to a life built on wealth and power is this deep insecurity. If you read earlier on in Daniel chapter 2, here is the most powerful man in the world, and he is completely scared. He's filled with anxiety. And you see, that is the problem with idols, is that they never satisfy the needs for security, the need for love, the need for meaning. If I build my hope on wealth, I will always want a little bit more. If I build my significance on what I do, then when I get older and can't do it, what happens? Or if there's someone that's better than me, what happens? We will get in this constant cycle of trying to prove ourselves and do more and more. If I build my life on power, I will always feel insecure. So there's a challenge to us today to perhaps expose some of those idols in our life that have too much of a grip on our heart that are creating a shaky foundation for us. It's so interesting. I could pick a number of stories from various celebrities that illustrate for this. It's so interesting how many celebrities who are at the pinnacle of wealth and status are overcome with insecurity and addiction and broken relationships. I was reading an article by a therapist in New York City recently who is a therapist to celebrities. And uh, he was just saying that every celebrity he meets turns into a monster in one way or another. There's just like this deep brokenness, this deep insecurity that lies beyond the facade of success. I heard a a story, this is an older story from a Chris Everett, a a champion tennis player back in the 70s, and there's an interview in one of the books I was reading about what she said when retirement came, and she said, I was depressed and afraid because so much of my life had been defined by being a champion. I was completely lost. Winning made me feel like somebody. I needed the wins, the applause to have an identity. It's not an interesting just observation, and there's uh, many more we could pull up. But when we build our lives on things like success or wealth, it is a shaky foundation that's going to come crumbling down. The antidote in this text is a call to build our lives on a bigger foundation, on this stone that will grow into this large mountain, this firm foundation that I can root my identity not in what I do, but in the fact that I am beloved by God. That I can root my hope not in temporary success or temporary resources, but in the hope that nothing will separate me from the love of God, not death, not sickness, not hardship. That my capacity to have meaning and purpose in this world is not defendant just solely on my self-effort, which always lets us down, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. So my challenge to us today is to come to a place like Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar comes to in this text. To humble ourselves before the feet of God and say, surely you are the God of gods, the Lord of lords. I believe that the antidote to these idols that we cling to is not to just cut them out, but to actually replace them with a different foundation, to discover that it is in Christ I have meaning, security, purpose, and hope. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has a moment of awareness at the end of chapter two. He is humbled. He realizes that God is the true God, and he is not God. But he's going to forget this, even in the matter of a few verses, and he's going to have to relearn this a few times. And I think that is telling, because I think we need to relearn this from time to time, that we have a tendency to crawl back to those old idols, to lose sight of our true foundation. Maybe today is one of those moments Maybe today is a time for us to again humble ourselves before God and say that you are the true God. You are the true Lord of Lords. Can we rest in that 
and build our life on that. As we uh, end our service, what I'd like to do now is create some space for response. On the third Sunday, we often have a, a prayer of healing, which is looking differently right now. But I'm going to invite Pastor Janet now to lead us through a time where we can recenter our lives on the hope that God is with us, to bring our prayers, our petitions, our needs before God. So let's enter into a time of prayer.